All right, guys, welcome back to the channel. Mr. Feed the Fish here. I got my friend Adam, and uh, today we are going to be talking about his 600-gallon uh, plywood DIY build. Uh, we're going to give you guys a walkthrough, uh, show you guys some fish, and uh, also show you guys how this whole system is running. So stick around. Okay, so this is all made out of plywood. Um, it took me about four months start to finish to do everything. I have a shop out back that I actually cut everything, but with the size of it, I actually had to bring everything down into the basement, assemble everything as I went and put it all together. It took 72 eight foot two by fours to build everything inside this that you see here. Another thing I guess to back up, I wanted to say thanks to all the YouTube channels out there. I learned a lot from watching everybody else's DIY videos on making these. I kind of took bits and pieces from what all I saw and this is kind of like my version of what I ended up with. I hope at the end of this, you know, maybe there's little bits and pieces of this that people will take away that maybe they want to try at their houses or a new idea to, to try out and see if you can do it or not. It was definitely a learning process. The dimensions, it's 10 foot long from start to finish. It's six foot tall and four foot deep. Um, the actual water column inside is 600 gallon. Uh, the water span is eight foot across inside the tank. It's got a foot hollow gap on each side of the water wall so that all the plumbing the air lines and all the wiring and everything have a space to run hidden. One thing that I noticed when I was building this, when I was watching a lot of videos, for my own personal taste, I like a finished look on the outside where it's all skinned in and trimmed. And I kind of wanted it to look like a piece of furniture in the basement too. I didn't want it to like stick out as a, an unfinished aquarium. A lot of the ones that I've seen have the open exposed two by fours and everything is inside. And, it's all personal taste with everybody. For me, I just wanted to try to come up with a finished look. With the viewing window too, the way my basement is laid out, I really don't have a need for any viewing windows on the sides of this tank. It's all facing into the basement. So I just did one viewing panel, but it's more of a stand-up tank the way everything is laid out. So when you come through the walkway, the, the framed out window view with all the two by fours, when, if I, when I finished the outside of it, it let you have kind of a, a window ledge or a viewing ledge to come up and stand. And it's just, it works really good with how our basement is because you can just walk right up, stand there and see everything as you come into the basement. The, the glass gives it a little bit of a, a different perspective when you're looking in it. It looks a little bit shallower than what it is, but the actual body holding the water is eight foot across, four foot deep and three foot tall of water. So. It's right at about, I think math wise, it comes out to really close to 600 gallons. And then the sump underneath, which we'll get to here a little bit, the sump is also a plywood sump that I built and it holds roughly a hundred gallons. So the canopy, as you look at it here too, with the trim, this whole piece right here actually comes off and it'll slide. So the whole entire top of the tank, you can have open access to if you want. But within the canopy here up top, there's four doors that are cut that are two, I think they're three foot across and two foot deep. And they open up just like regular glass doors on a tank. They got handles. So if you got to clean or reprogram the lights or any kind of maintenance work you got to do on it, it's all divided off. So you don't have to take the canopy off because it's heavy. It, it, it's a lug to try to get off. But there's a little feed door that's cut up in the center here. So you just take this right off and you can feed right through the middle. It makes it easier so you don't have to fight anything. If I remember right, I think it took a three gallon kit of Pond Shield to waterproof everything on the inside. To waterproof everything, it's all Pond Shield on the interior. And then on all of the seams, I fiberglassed everything. And then once it's all coated, I siliconed everything because the way these products work if I remember this right, you, the pond shield will not go on to silicone and seal, but if you put the pond shield on first and let that cure, the silicone adheres to pond shield. So 
you silicone all the seams as your very last step and it just gives you a little added security so you don't have to worry about leaks on it. I think it has eight sheets of three quarter inch plywood that's all cut up to make the inside reinforcements. Um, a little bit later, one of the one of the things that I was worried about, it turned out okay, but when we look at the sump on a lot of your aquarium cabinets, they have the divider stems where your doors close against. I wanted a whole entire open sump area on the bottom. So if you do any kind of cleaning, if you got to get in there and fix anything, two grown adults can crawl in here and work on this if they need to because it's all open. But with doing that, you had to make headers. So when you build the entire outside skeleton of the base of this, I built it just like a, a two part stand and then the tank. And then it's all actually joined together. But with the four by eight dimension that I went with on the plywood, the floor of this that's holding the water is three sheets of three quarter inch plywood stacked on top of each other. And the reason I kept it just down to eight feet is that I don't have to worry about any seams on the floor and waterproofing anything. It's all, the only thing I had to do was fill in all the screw head holes and epoxy over them, but there's no seams that are taking any weight or any pressure. Everything on the bottom of the floor throughout the tank also is built like a wall of a house, but it's got a cross brace structure, like a bridge in a way. So you got four, four, four two by fours together that are also interlaced with straight two by fours across and then they're angled two by fours in the middle of everything that disperses all of the weight to the outside edges of the headers so it can hold all the weight. From what math I can figure out by looking at some stuff on the calculators, it's right around 5,300 pounds of water that's suspended up in the air over top of everything. So I wanted to make sure having an open sump with no middle structure for bracing that it wasn't gonna collapse it but everything seems to be working okay. I haven't had any problems and I've went through a lot of water changes and the tanks, it seems to be doing good to this point so far. So one of the things I like about building the tank the way I did, a lot of people with the glass, when they go to put it into the tank, <clears throat> they build a temporary holding structure and they put the glass up and they use the silicone to make the seam, but the silicone is also holding the entire weight of the glass suspended. I didn't do that. With mine, I decided to run a two by four along the bottom before I waterproofed everything so that when the glass goes in, the glass actually went in, sat down onto the two by four and pushed into a bunch of silicone to make the seam. And then I sealed it up against the wall. What that does when you come in and you look inside the viewing area, like on one of these tanks, your substrate is right at the bottom of your tank. With this, you actually see six inches down into the tank and it kind of gives you like a three-dimensional look to it. I personally like that because when the fish are swimming around, you can see the top of the fish and they actually look like they're coming up out of the water at you in the tank. It was just something kind of cool the way it happened that way. I don't know if the camera would be able to show you guys or not, but if you look up where the water comes into the tank, I made a PVC spray bar. So I have two two-inch line, or I'm sorry, two inch and a half lines coming back up on the returns and it's putting it out as a spray bar, trying to keep all of the flow through the tank going evenly. But I really didn't want to buy anything. I wanted to try to make as much as I could on my own to make everything work. Let's talk about the, let's talk about what you got going on over here on okay. the side with all these gadgets. If I was to just walk down here and see this, I wouldn't, I would have no clue what's going on. So, Let's get these, let's give everybody like a, you know, a perspective on how you set this up and the reason for all the, uh, the different buttons and stuff on here. Okay. So I guess I just kind of refer to this as the control panel for everything. Um, I wanted to go with the same look as the viewing window. So it has a finished look on the outside of it, which is why this is like recessed and trimmed out. And it's got the plywood casing on the outside but a lot of videos that i was watching when you look at a lot of guys that have the saltwater tanks they have the really nice cnc machined control panels where everything is really nice and cut into everything i really like that clean look on everything i wanted to try to do my example of it but on a real simple level by just cutting out some plywood holes and painting it black and trying to make it look nice and 
I like the individuality of everything and you have access to turn each thing on the tank on and off if you need to for whatever kind of work you're doing. But if you're doing water changes on this thing or if you're if you're doing any kind of maintenance, you don't just have to pull the plug out of the wall and shut everything off. You can turn everything individually. So what you're looking at here, these are two Hyger 800 watt titanium heaters. This is the third heater here, which I don't have on. This is a spare in case one of these would go bad. I have a backup spare that's built in. These are the two boxes for the sump pump, circulator pumps. This is the inline water monitor that's down into the sump with the probe. So at all times, this tells me what the pH is, what the temperature of the tank is, and what the hardness level is of the tank. And it keeps everything going automated so and nothing against anything with the the test kits i have i did it too myself but with with this kind of a setup and the way i built everything i would rather just come down and be able just to look at the water monitor and see what's going on right on demand so you know with me i just got into stingrays and i'm nervous about keeping them living and wanting my water to be right make sure i don't do anything bad for the fish so i can come down and immediately look and see what's going on with the water if there's anything that i need to try to adjust um this this is probably one of my most favorite pieces of equipment so so does every button here have a function or are some of these buttons don't have function and why don't you have for people that for people that don't know what's going on here, um, none of these are labeled. You know, it's just numbers. So in order for you to know what what's what, do you go off the numbers or do you just know what the switch is? So when I, when I built everything, I actually had a cheat sheet that I had to make up. And each one of these has a function on the tank. If it's lit up, that means it's on and running. If it's off, it's because I'm not using it. Um, I can go through here and explain everything, but with the switches <clears throat> i've used them enough and just been down here with the tank enough that i know what everything is and i remember it sometimes i hit something wrong and something will happen to remind me that i was wrong <laughs> but for the most part i got everything down from memory and if some, if like if i was gone on vacation or something i'd make a little cheat sheet up for somebody just in case they needed to do something but it's basically like having switches these are big power panels where everything is plugged in from a main cord but it just allows you to break everything up individually. So to go through it, I guess, on the top of the aquarium, this switch here is running a fan bar that I have. Um, one of the things that I found out I was having problems with was the moisture, since I don't have any kind of hard glass or plastic covering, the wood was kind of getting, the doors were warping a little bit from the moisture. Right. So I have a fan bar that's installed down on the other end. These turn the fans on and off. This switch here is for the FX filter on the bottom that I have. This one here is the work light for the sump. So anytime you got to do work down in the sump, it's just an on off switch for the light. These three switches here are for the heaters. This is for the air bubbler machine. This is for the water change system that I have that turns on the pumps in another room that feed water to the tank. Um, these are for the UV lights. These are for the aquarium lights and then, oh, I'm sorry from right here. So these are the UV lights and the overhead lights. And then these two right here are for my two pumps in the sump that turn the circulator pumps on and off. So if you want to clean the sump or something and you want to shut everything off, you can just turn the sump pumps off and keep everything else going. So you don't have to reset all of your programs on your lights or the settings and everything. It can keep it all powered on for you. So you don't have to worry about resetting everything just because you want to clean the sump or do something. So there's a lot of lights and a lot of buttons here, but each one of them actually does have a purpose. To move into the, the sump area of the tank here, again, I kind of wanted like the finished look of everything. I didn't want like an exposed stand. So I wish that there were some magnets that were strong enough, but for right now, I've got screws holding this in with kids and dogs. I just want to be safer than sorry, but... This is trimmed out right here along this here with the handles. This is actually the access door for the sump. So I'll get the door off here. So these two screws come out 
it's a finished look on the outside, but this whole door actually gets removed. So this is the whole sump area down here. And then on the control, on the control panel. So if you, when you go to work, like I was telling everybody, this is the work light for the sump. So you kick it on here and it kicks on the light so you can see everything going on down here. It's about a hundred gallon sump. This is also all made out of plywood on the exterior. It's got plywood dividers on the interior. It's made up of a bio ball trickle tower at the top section. Um, so, so I'm what's going on. Let them, uh, can you take the, sure. you take the covers off so they can. If one of you guys wants to grab that little piece. So like I had said before, um, this is where the water comes in through the two return lines here. On the top of the sump, there's a two, a two cubic foot space of bio balls that are in the top here. So it's a trickle tower. It comes through, um, I use light diffuser chunks that I cut to fit, but the balls are suspended up here. The water runs through. It goes into 25 pounds of ceramic tube tiles down here. And then I baffled it just like your regular sump that you buy in a store. There's a space that comes through so the water's channeled. It comes up through all the filters, the filter pads. Um, I recently changed this out. That's why the, the K2 is still hanging in the water. It hasn't got enough bacteria to sink yet, but this is all new. I had lava rock in here, but I switched it over to K2. One of the, the guys that I bought my stingrays from suggested that I change this over to K2. So if you look, once all this stuff eventually sinks, inside this bin alone by itself, I have a circulator pump going. So once these get full enough of bacteria and they all start to sink, this will be a, an individual moving bed of K2 in this chamber right here. But in these dividers here, you can see where I've got seven one inch holes drilled across here. So it's chambered just like a sump where it's coming up through and down and it makes its way through each chamber. So once it goes through the moving bed here, I also have 25 pounds of crushed coral in the bottom of these two chambers here to hold the pH steady. So as the water filters its way through, there's crushed coral and then ceramic tile bacteria holders here. And it goes through the top chamber and flows down into the UV chamber. And from the UV chamber, it goes back up to two return pump lines. It's roughly 100 gallons. And like I said, the exterior and the interior, it's all made out of three quarter plywood. The FX filter in the back, a lot of people ask why I even have that with the sump this big. <clears throat> the reason I did that is because I want to try to make the flow of the filtration going through the aquarium as even as possible. The intake for the FX is down on the bottom corner of the opposite side of the tank here. So the overflows and the FX are both filtering the water from the top of the tank and the bottom of the tank. And I'm hoping it just creates an even flow through the body of water. It's just kind of... It's a helper filter. So, uh, I know Adam has been wanting to get, uh, I know you've been wanting to get stingrays for quite some time. I know you had a few trial and errors with it. Uh, I've seen you at the fish store and we, you know, we talked for a little bit and uh, you was just looking for uh, somebody that you could trust to get your stingrays from, you know, that was almost guaranteed to have a good quality stingray because you, like I said, you had trial and error before with the stingray. So you finally got a couple stingrays and stuff. So let's talk about uh, what kind of stingrays you got and the success that you've had with them since you got them. So in the tank, um, I finally got, I'm, I'm actually holding two of these for my friend while we're getting his setup done, but I have two albino pearls that are buried in here. You can see one in the back and then I have personally um, a black diamond and I want to say a shout out to J4 um, out of Chicago. He's a excellent, excellent dealer to deal with. His customer service is awesome. Super nice guy. Anybody ever wants to do stingrays or any other kind of fish that he has, he's an amazing guy to deal with. I highly recommend him to anybody and I've had a great experience with him. Um, 
we actually drove up to Chicago from, from my area where I'm at. It's about a three hour drive to go up there. Well worth the drive. The guy, the guy is awesome to do business with. Um, in this tank currently, like I said, we've got the two albino pearls, one black diamond, and then this is Gus. This is my Mabu puffer that I got out of Denver, Colorado. Uh, we actually had him shipped here and I kind of did a little research and I tracked his history of everything. He comes from the Congo River in Africa and something unique that I really like about this guy. Um, I became interested in him from watching YouTube and uh, Corey on Aquarium Co-op had Murphy and I watched a couple of his videos and uh, right then and there when I saw him I said I need to have one of those. So this tank came to be the size that it is so that Mur that Gus and the Stingrays have plenty of room in here. So he's been doing really good since I got him. Um, he could actually fit in my hand when I first bought him. He's about nine, ten months old right now. I'm hoping that he'll get about two, two and a half foot long when he's full grown. And uh, he seems to be doing really good. I haven't had any problems. The Stingrays are doing good. They have a really good um, feeding response. I think I finally got all the, the water parameters figured out for everything in here, and it's been going pretty smooth so far. Uh, when I'm all said and done with, my goal for this tank is to get Gus full grown and I'd like to have maybe four uh, black diamonds. I might mix a, a super white hybrid into that too. I really like those, but I want to, uh, the, the end game for this tank for me is to have the puffer, four stingrays, and that's probably going to be it. And I hope to have a super white in there if, if possible. So everything's going pretty good and I'm happy with it so far. Now that we figured all that out, let's uh, show them where all the magic happens and how everything is run okay. for your system, how you do water changes. and Oh, one more question I got is, so when you turn off all the pumps for the tank, um, does the sump fill up or is there is there some something on there, a ball valve or anything on there that you to stop the water from flowing down to the sump? Because I'm pretty sure that some people watching... You can, I mean, you can see here that the water is, you know, it's pretty high. So, so one thing that, good point, um, I forgot to talk about that. One of the things that I still have yet to do, um, where the water comes in over here, I'm going to switch out the tubes, and I'm actually going to replace those with the ball valves. So if I need to do some work, I can shut the pumps off, but I also want to have ball valves so that I can turn off the overflows right. so they don't drain. But when I did all of this... The way I set the overflows at the water level, if I were to lose power, the amount of water that comes from the overflows will top the sump off. I might have a little bit of run over, maybe a gallon of spillage, possibly nothing that I can't just clean up with the towel. But I did the return lines big enough so that I don't have to have a lot of water pressure over the top pushing the water down to be gravity fed. Right. And I also have the returns at an angle so that the water goes into them easier up top. So if I were to lose power, there's not a whole lot of water that has to drain to, to get it to stop underneath the overflows so I don't have any flood issues. So in the basement here around the corner, I kind of have an open walkway here. It kind of, it turned out really nice with the basement layout. This was, this was done years ago, but it just, it worked out really good. Um, this is the pump room where all of the water comes in to the house and I built everything off of this to have water change, holding water, filtered water, RO water, and everything in here going that feeds all the tanks. So I don't have to actually go upstairs or hook up stuff to the sink. Everything can be done right here from this room. I call this the water room. So in here, we have a 210 gallon bin that I store water and I preheat everything. So when it comes time for water changes, I have a pumping system built into this that's hooked up to the control panel of the big tank. So everything is automated that I can hook up a quick hose and I can turn switches on to kick on pumps to send everything over to the tanks. Um, on the other side here, 
I have the reverse osmosis system set up. This is a high spring uh, water system here and it makes 500 gallons a day is what the filtration rate is. So what happens is my main water inlet pump to my house is down underneath my 200 gallon bin. There is a water line that feeds the RO filtration right here. It goes down into these three garbage, the brute garbage cans. Those are also holding water. It's 130 gallons. In each one of those bins, I have a heater that you can see up top here that's also preheated for the water changes. So what happens is these all fill up. I have small circulator pumps inside each garbage can here. It circulates all the water while it's being stored so that when I add minerals back to it, it mixes everything evenly. This first tank has a pump that sends the cycled water up through the trickle tower that keeps all of the water going through filter floss. It empties down into the middle basket here. There's another pump that picks it back up, sends it through the secondary trickle tower that keeps it flossed and that sends it down into the third tank. And on the bottom, all three of these are connected with bulkheads and they're tied together so that it's a full circulating circuit. So all of the water stays evenly heated and evenly circulated until it goes back to the tanks. The way I do my water in my area where I live with the farmers in the fields, with all of the fertilizing and everything that goes on, the, the makeup of the water down here has a lot of different chemistry throughout the year. So the reason I do RO is I start with absolutely nothing in the water. It's, it's about four parts per million when I store it. And then I use sea chem stability and I add minerals back to it. So every single water change, I know within about 10 parts per million, I remineralize everything back up to 150 ppm. So there's no nitrates, there's no chlorine. I don't have to put prime or anything in for the chlorine or chloramine. It's, it's basically a clean sheet of water, every water change with nothing in it. And it's remineralized back up to 150 ppm. And the pH is steady right at about 7.5 at all times. So I don't ever have to worry. If any fluctuations happen, it's because something's going on in the tank. But every water change is the exact same water in every single time with no variance. If you look at the big tank here, there's, there's a system set up to a pump right here. This is the on and off valve for a safety valve, but you open this valve up like this and you go over to the control panel on the big tank. And when you turn it on, it pumps water up and through over through the ceiling. And if you guys look over here, these are my two connection points for my water to go to the tanks. This top part right here is the feed line that comes from the filter room. So I hook a hose up to this and then I put it into the tank. And then like I told you guys earlier, I hit the number eight switch and that starts all the water pumping into the tank. So I don't actually have to run any hoses or do anything. It's all push button automated. When I go to drain the tank, this is the line that's connected to my septic line into my plumbing out to my septic field. So I switch the hose over to the drain line and I use that for all of the tanks too. When I pump it out, it goes, it goes out to my septic line. So there's no having to haul water or run great big long hoses and siphons and start everything. It makes water changing out of the basement a lot easier. All right, guys. So that's going to about wrap it up for this video. Uh, I just want to thank Adam for uh, letting me come through that's today nice and uh, check out the, the 600 and Everything that he's got going on, you guys can see uh, everything down here is to the T. He has uh, inspired me to do something different in my fish room. And uh, this is the Aqua Lounge. So this is my first time coming down, seeing everything. And uh, like I said, I just want to give a thanks to Adam. And I'm, I'm glad I met him at the at uh, the fish store, our local fish store. And... Yeah, he's got a lot of other stuff going on down here. But if you guys want to see that, you're going to have to go over to Boss Aquatics channel and check that out. And uh, if you guys have any questions, leave it down in the comments. And we're going to uh, see you guys in the next one.